Hello everyone, it's great to be here today. So, hi, I'm Leah. Here's a fun fact you may, not know, you, you may not have heard about me. I grew up in Greece, and more specifically, in the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian, probably the first you, you've ever met. Seriously, that's what the word lesbian means. It means person from Lesbos. The other meaning came later. <laughs> uh, in other news, I love open source. You might have used some of my work. Um, I'm an invited expert in the CSS Working Group, as just mentioned. And as my, my day job is research and sometimes teaching at MIT. Uh, I work on a language called Mavo, uh, which is an HTML-based language for defining entire web applications without writing JavaScript or backends. And sometimes I teach user interface design and implementation. Um, so, why is the title of this talk even more CSS Secrets? I mean, the CSS Secrets, okay, kind of makes sense, but why even more, even more than what? So, it's because it's a sequel. Yes, talks can have sequels, not just movies. So, many years ago, I used to give this talk called CSS Three Secrets. Um, it was among my first talks, and it was because at some point I realized that I find it too confining that I have to give a talk about a specific topic. There's so many exciting things about CSS, right? Why do I have to pick just one? So I made this talk about 10 things that I found interesting at the time about CSS. You can see short descriptions of all 10 of them there. And the talk is on YouTube if you want to look it up, if any of them sounds interesting. And then the next year, I did another sequel, which I called More CSS Secrets, with another 10 things. And for many years after that, I kind of slid into the format of one specific topic per talk. Uh, and recently, I thought, I kind of want to do another CSS Secrets talk again. And that was after, um, so my book also came out of these talks, which had 47 secrets, which secrets is just code for things I find cool about CSS, things I like and I want to share about CSS. So that brings us to today and this talk, and that's why it's called Even More CSS Secrets. And let's get to the first one, which is cut out text. You may have noticed this in the headline uh, of this talk, um, on the cover in the previous slide, and also this slide. So how many of you have used blending modes in Photoshop or CSS? Way more hands when I said Photoshop. So today, we can use blending modes in CSS. They work exactly the same way as in Photoshop. They even have the same names, because they were invented by Adobe at the point where they were interested in contributing to web standards. Um, <laughs> there was a time. Uh, and as you can see, they work in exactly the same way you're used to from Photoshop. Um, I can change this color, you can see what happens. But most people, let's try, let's change this as well, let's make it a gray or something, you can sort of see what happens. So most people use blending modes because they've pattern matched on how they work from experience. They've tried them, they've, they've seen what happens, but they can't quite explain why it happens. They've instinctively learned that you, you always get a darker color of the two that you're combining, but that's, that, that's about it. So the actual algorithm behind blending modes is multiplication. That's why it's called multiply. It just converts the RGB components of each color to percentages, and it just multiplies the percentages, that's it. So I've made this little app so I can show you here how this works when I change the colors. And you can see the math here and how it changes. I mean, I can even use um, named colors. By the way, all my slides are online, so you can play with this afterwards yourselves as well. So the interesting bit here, okay, I mean, it multiplies together the two colors, so you get, like, the result of the multiplication. What is interesting, though, is what happens with black and white, which is kind of special. So as you can see, when I multiply any color with black, 
let's say, let, let me change it, maybe yellow green, maybe lemon chiffon. Anything I multiply with black gives me black because I'm multiplying each RGB component with zero. And what do I get when I multiply a number with zero? Zero. So always gives me back black. White has the opposite effect. Let's try a few colors here. And as you can see, anything I multiply with white gives me back the same color. So I can use this here to give me a cutout text effect. All I need to do is give a black color to the text. Uh, no, the other way around, Leah, think. Remember, anything I multiply with white gives me the same color, and anything I multiply with black gives me black. So if I want to have cutout text, which is cut out out of black, I, I just apply a black background and a white text color, and that's it. And the best thing is that this degrades perfectly gracefully. If blending modes are not, su uh, are not supported, this is what I get, which is perfectly fine. It's even more readable because it has like the maximum contrast you could possibly get. So, you might be wondering now, okay, but what if I don't want black as my background? What do I do then? Well, if, you're, if, if you want white, I still have a solution for you. So there's another blending mode called screen, for which the math is a little bit more complicated. You can see it here. And it sort of works as an opposite of, of multiply. So notice here that if, actually, I'm going to write an RGB one again. Yeah, it works. So notice here that anything I screen with white gives me white. And similarly, you'll see that anything I screen with black gives me the color I screened it with. So why is that? So it, the, the math is a little more involved here, but basically it's because when I'm screening with white, this becomes zero. And because this is multiplying, this entire thing goes away. So every single component becomes 100%. Does that make sense? I see some nodes. Um, similarly, when I'm screening with black, let's try a few colors here. You can see where this is going. Anything I screen with black gives me back the same color. And that's because, similarly, if we look at the math, this is 100% minus zero, so it just becomes 100%. When I multiply something with 100%, it just stays what it was. And then, because we have the minus here, the, the two 100%s cancel each other out, and I get the 30% that I had here. And same for the other components. So, what does that mean in practice? If I make my background here uh, white, my text color black, and my blending mode screen, I can get a cutout a, a, the cutout text effect with the white background. So the next question is, okay, how do I get a cutout text effect with other colors? I don't have a good solution to suggest to you. Uh, it is possible if you, if you create a copy of the text and position it behind, and it, but it's just not worth it. Like, anything that involves duplicating text in CSS is usually no, not worth it. If you can find a way that doesn't involve duplicating text, please tweet at me. Um, blending modes have very decent browser support, uh, and in most cases, I mean, yes, it's not amazing, but it's pretty decent. And in most cases, they degrade gracefully. Like in both of these effects, if we don't have blending modes, we still have a perfectly readable, very nice contrast headline. It's, it works fine. So these are some takeaways from this first one. So the second secret I wanted to share is using characters as images. Take a look at this background. You see unicorns, you see chocolate ice creams, and you see a number two. <laughs> All of these are not, none of these are images. It's a background created with text characters. So how do we do that? And the secret is SVG, which I like to call the cheat code of web design, because it lets you do things that CSS doesn't. 
or that are difficult with CSS. So here I have a data URI that is defining a simple SVG, uh, a simple SVG with a, with a red circle. How many of you have used data URIs in any way? Most of you. How many of you have used data URIs that were not base64 encoded? Way fewer. So yeah, you don't actually need to escape most characters. You can just have data URIs where the SVG code is just like this. The main thing to notice is that you have to escape the, the line breaks. If I do this, everything breaks. So you have to escape the line breaks in CSS um, every time you have a multi-line URL. But that's about it. And there are a few more characters like the pound sign um, and a few more that you have to escape. But most characters are fair game in data URIs. And this is not just for SVGs, by the way. You can create entire HTML pages with data URIs. You can do all sorts of things. But here we're going to focus on SVG. So let's make this background a little smaller. Let's make it 100 pixels. Oh, what? why did I say background clip? Background size, Leah. OK, so now we get a bunch of circles, which is not super interesting, because we can do the same thing with radial gradients. But once we're in SVG land, we can do other cool things, like use the text element. Now, you might be wondering what's cool about this, because like, you can't see anything. But now that I've set the baseline, so yeah, SVG has a lot of bad defaults. You have to set many things explicitly, but I think the result pays off. So yeah, you have to set the baseline explicitly, because by default it's zero, which is like completely off the SVG and you don't see anything. And also you have to set the font size, because by default it's something super small, and our view box is 100 by 100, so we set it to 90, because we wanted something sort of big. So now we have a background that is the A character, which is not super interesting, but we can make it a unicorn. And that is much more interesting. And because, we, because everything, because we're defining an SVG file here, we can have access to whatever we can do in an SVG file. You know what we can do in an SVG file? We can have style elements. Yes, I'm adding style elements inside the data URI that is inside my SVG. It literally doesn't get more meta than this. <laughs> and then inside this style element, I can have a keyframes rule. And let's say, let's set a transform. Let's say rotate minus 20 degrees, maybe. And now let's go here and add inline style that makes it dance. And there it is. Our unicorn is now dancing. So not only we can use this trick to have to, make, to turn characters into images without having to include any images, but we can even make them animated images. Like, who needs GIFs anymore? <laughs> Not to mention that, like, we can have all the emojis here. Now we have chocolate ice cream that's dancing. And we can change them super easily. And this is not just useful for typical backgrounds. I mean, here I have a meter. And it's like a star rating widget. And it's all CSS. I, have, I didn't have to include any stars. It's just the Unicode character that is a star. And yes, I'm using a WebKit pseudo element here. And in practice, you would need to use another one for Mozilla and another one for Edge. But still, the good thing is that not only you can make star rating widgets this way, but you can make um, similar widgets about any anything. Like, now we are rating chocolate ice creams. Isn't that awesome? And all the values work just fine. No images required. Unfortunately, notice that I had to repeat the same image twice, the same URL twice, just to change the opacity. And some of you might wonder, can't we use a CSS variable with, for that? The answer is no, we can't. Um, for two reasons. We cannot concatenate strings in CSS yet, and also URL is weird. URL has weird parsing rules because you can use um, URLs inside it without quotes, so because of that, you can't really use any CSS function inside URL. 
Eventually, we're going to solve both of these problems. We're going to add another function, probably maybe fetch, maybe something like that. Um, basically, a function that does the same thing, but only accepts strings. And also, we're, we're going to add something for string concatenation. It looks like that's going to be called text, like a text function. But all of these are in the future. Right now, we can't use variables in there. If you want to reduce duplication, you can always use a preprocessor and use preprocessor variables, which can be used for anything. So, some takeaways from this. You can turn glyphs into animated images with SVG data URL, URLs, and you can use this trick also the style meters with discrete icons. So, the third one is, is fancy borders. Look at this border. How would you do that border with CSS? I mean, yeah, we can do dashed borders with a single color, but we cannot control the size of the dashes. It's just whatever the browser is willing to give us that day. And we cannot have gradients on our borders, really. There's border image, but it's kind of a pain. So how would we do something like that? It's like in, in CSS borders are not even animated. So let's look into it. First off, the first thing um, I want to tell you today has to do with SVGs again, and it's called stroke dash array. So notice here, I have a rectangle with a black stroke, uh, a stroke with width of, of four pixels and no fill. Notice that I'm actually, uh, I'm actually seeing two pixels here, not the four I've defined. That's because half of the stroke is outside the rectangle and it's non-trivial to get it in. Uh, so, there is the stroke dash array uh, property. Did I say function? That lets you define the size of the dashes and the size of the gaps. Oh, uh, right. And the size of the gaps. And you can see how I can change them however I want. But what's really cool about this is also when it's used in, con in conjunction with a dash stroke dash offset property. So let's see what this does. Notice that when I'm reducing this, it moves the dashed border. And what's really cool is that if, if my stroke dash offset is a multiple of my stroke length and the gap length, then it has no effect. Why is that cool, you might wonder? So that's cool because it means I can do a looping animation. So let's add a style element and the keyframes rule. Let's call it ants. And let's say two stroke dash offset minus 15 pixels. And let's come here and add an animation. And one second infinite so that it loops. So that's almost there. It's almost like marching ants. But it has a problem. It's not smooth. It's like going and stopping and going and stopping. That's not how a marching ants animation works. It should be smooth. And the reason for that is that the timing function by default is ease. So we have, if we want it to be linear and not accelerate or decelerate at any point, I mean, ease works well for most animations. It makes them look much more natural than linear. But in this case, we actually want linear. So there we go. Now it's a proper marching ants animation. Except that's, that's an SVG. It's not in our CSS, so it doesn't look, it's not as interesting. But we can copy this. And then we can add it to our, SV, uh, to our CSS. Here I just have a div with a class of unicorn. And my data URI is ready here. Yes, you can have emojis in class names. So let's go here and let's escape faithfully all our lines, because otherwise stuff breaks. And there it is. And actually, I can change the, the text and everything. And it just works. It looks just like a normal. Um, a normal CSS border, except it's cooler. So at this point, we can do the marching ants part of the title um, animation. But what about the gradient part? So another cool thing about SVG is that it lets us color stroke. I mean, we can color strokes with plain colors, but we can also color them with gradients. The syntax is a little more painful. 
as with many things in SVG, because it came before all this. Like, SVG was the first thing that introduced gradients to the web. So yeah, the syntax is not as nice as in CSS because it came before. Probably CSS the syntax would also not be as nice as it is now if it had done it first. So let's give it an ID so we can link to it. Let's say grad, grad, gradient, whatever. And then this linear gradient element has stop elements inside it with stop color attributes. And let's give it that. And here, let's give it a gold color and an offset of one, because we have to specify the offsets explicitly here. And now we go here and we replace the color with this. And there's our gradient. We can change the offset if we want more blue. And we can also apply a gradient transform if we want to transform the gradient, most, the, the main use case of which is to rotate it. And also, the, rota the SVG transforms have a slightly different syntax than in CSS. Notice that there's no deg. And actually, if I add deg here, it breaks. That's also because SVG transforms came before CSS transforms, so they have slightly different syntax. But notice that if I use them inside CSS in SVG, then we get the CSS syntax. It can be a little confusing. If you're not sure, try both syntaxes. So, again, this is in a rectangle, so it may not be as interesting, but we can copy it in our data URI. Same thing here, same deal. More lines to escape. Whoa. And we are almost there. Except, notice one thing. I said earlier that it behaves exactly like a CSS border, which is slightly false. We couldn't see the difference earlier because it was a very thin border, but here that we have a thick border, we can actually see that it, it's obvious that this is actually a background. It's a very flexible background, but still a background. So we can work around that by applying some padding to offset. The, the actual border. And just like before, we've defined a stroke width of 40 pixels, but we actually get 20, so that's all we need to account for. Hence the 20 here. So, takeaways from here. SVGs with no view box, notice that all of my SVGs had no view box attribute. They spread to cover the entire area, their coordinate system is defined by that, and strokes stay the same width regardless. We can use that to apply fancy SVG strokes to our HTML elements. SVG gives our CSS superpowers in a way. So the fourth thing I wanted to share is line headings. Um, sometimes you see lines, uh, you see headings that have these lines that sort of flex to account for the width of the text. Usually they're not animated like here. Um, and here I have a simple H1 with not much styling at this point. And I'm going to show you how you can do that effect. So we have two pseudo elements here. We apply some content. I'm going to add a letter here that I'm going to remove later. And the background, just so I can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to add a background here, just so I can see what I'm doing. OK. So we give the heading, whoa, a display of flex. And then we got to make the heading 100% to account for the whole width. Otherwise, nothing much would happen. And then we stretch these yellow areas by applying flex one. We can remove this now. We're almost there. We can also remove the gray background. And now we can style this however we want. Maybe let's give it a height of 0.1 and we usually don't want them to be this tall, uh, this high up, so maybe align items center, and we don't want them to be this stuck, so maybe a margin as well. And that's basically what it is. 
We can do other things like if we want, we can apply a border, border width top one pixel, right left zero, and a background of nothing. That's that needs to be thicker. And probably this should be thinner. Yep. So you get the idea, and it just adapts. And you can see what happens what, when you get to the next line. You just stop getting lines anymore, which I think is a perfectly fine behavior. It just adapts. We don't have to account for when we have too much text. Uh, so the main takeaway from here is that text nodes and pseudo elements can be flexed children as well which is kind of obvious if you think about it, but many people don't realize. Um, how many of you have done pop-up menus with CSS at some point? Most of you? OK, great. That's what I expected. So there's a problem when you do pop-up menus with CSS. At least there was. So usually, we do something like this. We have nested lists and A elements for the menu items, and then our CSS looks sort of like this. I've omitted fonts and backgrounds and stuff because that's obvious. So usually we do something like this with a hover pseudo class on the LI and then we display the UL. And when I hover over these items, I can see their submenus, I can click on their submenus. That's fine as long as you're, as, as long as you're able bodied and you can use a mouse. What happens if you can't use a mouse and you depend on the keyboard? I try, let's try to tab through this menu. Nothing, nothing nothing. So while this is easy to do, it's not keyboard accessible. You might try to fix that by using the focus pseudo class like nav a focus plus ul. Basically uls after and a focused a element should become visible as well. And now the, the submenu does appear. But what happens when I actually try to tab through and click on one item? It disappears. It's just a teaser. It's just here to tell me, hey, there's a submenu here, but you, you don't actually have access to it. Sorry. Um, and same here. I'm just tabbing through, and it's just teasing me. I can't actually do anything. However, we recently got a new pseudo class that is centered around focus. It's called focus within. So focus within matches either a focused element or any of its any of its ancestors. It, it basically targets elements that contain a focused element. It's sort of like a very special case of the parent selector that we've all wanted for years, but it's, it's a very specific case of that. And no, we're not going to get a parent selector in CSS, I'm sorry. If you've heard anything about a has pseudo class, that's never going to happen in CSS. At least nothing's planned right now. Um, but focus within gives us some of the functionality so let's try to use it here. Whoa. Let's do focus within and then UL. Whoa, what happened here? Oh, the hell. Hmm. OK, well, they've disappeared now. Let's try to tab through. It opens. And I can actually tab through to specific items. Notice that my mouse is here. It's nowhere near the menu. And I can, just, I can tab through them just fine. It's just as accessible as a JavaScript-based uh, pop-up menu, but just with, a, with an extra line of CSS. And Focus Within has some decent browser support. It's basically Edge that's the problem right now. So the takeaway with from here is that focus within really helps to improve accessibility. And also something I haven't mentioned is that eventually we're also going to get a target within pseudo class. So that's going to also help with a bunch of use cases. In general, it's much easier to add more specific uh, parent selector pseudo classes like that than it is to add a generic parent selector. So how many were in the, in the talk earlier that mentioned variable fonts? 
I saw much more of you. Come on. Okay, so for those of you that weren't there, I think variable fonts are probably as big of a revolution in typography as the one we got in the 90s when we went from bitmap fonts to vector-based fonts, which may sound a little crazy, but let me explain. So back then in the 90s, we had to design each size of each, of the, of each font s separately and then export them with like bitmaps for each character of each size. And eventually we got vector-based fonts and the fonts not only became smaller, but also more flexible. It's the same thing now. We, until now, we had to design each, each weight separately. And if we wanted to use like a full, the entire range of all faces of a typeface, we had to include like a bunch of font files which was really heavy and expensive. Uh, well, the expensive part hasn't really changed very much, but the, the, te the tech part has changed. So with variable fonts, we can include all the variations of a font in the same file and it's completely continuous. So you can see here how you can completely change the font vfonts.com is a really cool website. It lists like most of the variable fonts that we know today. And some of the axes that you can have are very non-conventional. Let me see if I can find you. So someone did an emoji variable font with one of my favorite emojis, which you can probably guess now which one it is. So, come on, internet. Yes, there it is. So, and the variation axis, it's called cup height. Isn't that lovely? They called it cup height, and it actually changes the cup height. I cannot wait to get more variable fonts with emojis. But, back to normal characters for a bit. So here we have um, a multi-line heading with different sizes so that each word is aligned. And this is what the CSS looks like. And the more design inclined of you will have already spotted the problem here. Even though everything is the same weight, the R <coughs> looks much thicker. And the fonts also, the word fonts also looks slightly thicker but they're all the same weight. Why did that happen? Well, if, if you change the size of a character, it's natural that its strokes also appear thicker. But with variable fonts, we can actually tweak this because we can get the entire range of weights. With, with, with normal fonts, we could just go from like um, maybe light to uh, normal or to extra light, but that's, that was it. Whereas with variable fonts, I can start from the font weight of 300 that I have. Actually, maybe let's start here. I can start from here and go down until it looks right. And I think it looks right about here. And here as well, I can do the same thing. I can go down until it looks right. And I think it looks right at about 190. So that's probably the first takeaway that with variable fonts, we can tweak things to get exactly what we want. Uh, but also, you might think this is kind of a pain if every time I change the size, I also have to adjust the font weight. Well, there is something we can do about that. You would still have to adjust the font size manually, but at least not both of them. How many of you have heard of the term linear regression from statistics? Perhaps a few. So linear regression uh, is mostly used in statistics. It's basically, if you have a few points, then linear regression gives you a line that is as close as possible to all of your points. And if you have more than two points, it, it most likely won't hit them exactly, but it will try to minimize the distance from all points. And there's also quadratic regression which 
can come a little closer because it's, it's a second degree one. So for those of you that don't like math very much, you can rest assured that you will not have to calculate anything. There are websites today that you can, put, you can plug in all your numbers and they give you these equations back. So let's try to do that. You, and if you're wondering, okay, so this is about having a few points and getting back an, a, a line, but like what are our points here? Our points here are the sizes and the font weights. And what we need to find is a function that can give us any font weight at any given size, at any given font size. You can, we, can, we, can take, we can see the font size as sort of the independent variable and the font weight as the dependent variable here. So probably the most popular website for these kinds of things is called Wolfram Alpha. And I can actually make it bigger. Uh, it's called Wolfram Alpha. How many of you have heard of Wolfram Alpha? Half of you, okay. So basically, anytime you need to calculate anything non-trivial, there's some query that you can put into Wolfram Alpha and it gives you the result. So for a linear regression, which is basically to get the line, you type something like this. I've made a small app here that generates it for you, but you can just like type this in it. And this is the line we get. As you can see, it's not exactly this, it doesn't exactly go through our points, but it's close enough for most cases. And we can click on plain text and copy it from here. And now let's go back. So how do we apply this to our CSS? First off, we need to change the, to, to, to use a variable for setting the font size because we can't refer to the font size in an expression. So let's do this. Whoops. And now we got the same thing we had before with the font size. You might have wondered why I removed M's as well. Um, the reason is that today, if you have M's, you cannot get anything else in CSS. You can't go from a length to a number. You can only go from numbers to lengths uh, because we, you cannot divide with M's. So if, if you're going to be using something in calculations, you should set it to a, you should use plain numbers and then multiply them by whatever, by one of whatever unit you want. So, and let's say font weight here. And now let's paste our expression here. And what is our X? It's var size. So you didn't see a change because these are still here. So now the moment of truth. How different will it be if we remove these? Not that different. It's not 100% perfect. Probably the most seasoned designers among you might be able to see like a small change, but it's still like so much better than before that, than if we didn't specify any font weight for each specific, for each line. Like, remember how bad it was? And Another moment of truth is what happens if we need a different font size than the ones we had. So let's say we want to combine the, these two lines. And let's go here and we want to use smaller font size, like maybe 65. So notice that even though it looks much better than if we didn't have a font weight, a specific font weight for each line at all, if we didn't have this, if all of them were 300, this is what we get. So it's already, it's better, but it's not great. The R awesome is already, it is, is much, is obviously thinner than the rest of it. And that's because linear regression is a little more limited. You can see that it's not exactly, uh, it doesn't exactly fit our points. We can actually get closer with quadratic regression. And as you can see here, it actually completely fits our, our, those three points. It won't fit any point in between because it's highly unlikely that the actual underlying function is a second degree polynomial, but it gets closer. So if we copy this one, let me make it bigger. This is what it gave us. Let's click on plain text and copy it. 
And let's go here. And we'll replace this with the new one. And we replace any x's with var size. Here it was squared, so we have to do it twice. And another multiplication, and here as well. And maybe let's put it to multiple lines, because it's getting a little long. Isn't this much nicer looking? And let me show you other sizes as well. So as you can see, it works quite nicely up until fairly large sizes. I think it starts breaking after three or so. It will always break eventually. There will always be, yeah, it started breaking now. There will always be a point where it breaks when you use quadratic regression because essentially you get a parabola which goes like this. And you're just hoping that the sizes you want are in this part. Once it starts going up again, it breaks. So test with an, a, a large range of font sizes that you might need. And the good thing about this is that it's not tied to a particular use case. It's tied to a font but, and the specific weight that you're trying to emulate, but it's not tied to this particular use case. For example, another use case is, how many of you have, have read or heard the rule that in typography you should never try to emulate small caps? Fewer than I expected. Well, in typography, you should never try to emulate small caps. <laughs> because when you make, ca when you have to make them, you have to uh, shrink the same glyphs that are not designed for small caps, and you end up getting thinner strokes. Notice that the SQL there, that's, a, so another good practice in typography is that um, acronyms should use small caps because then they are less prominent, otherwise they draw the eye too much. But if we don't have real small caps characters, if the font doesn't actually have small caps glyphs, this is what happens. Like the SQL is, uh, word is much thinner, well, obviously thinner than the rest of it. And it's the same with, with superscripts and subscripts. Notice the citation needed um, superscript. It also doesn't look harmonious with the rest of the text. It looks thinner. We can apply the same trick, however. We can, go here, we can come here, use a variable for this, and then just paste in the same CSS we wrote previously. And now it looks much better. And when we wrote this code, we had no idea about this use case. This came later, but it works regardless. So these takeaway, uh, the, the takeaways from this is that the, the weight axis in variable fonts allows us to equalize strokes across different font sizes, which is useful for a variety of use cases, as we've seen. And linear or quadratic regression helps us to avoid calculating a weight every time, which would be a huge pain in the ass. Um, and also, thank you to Black Foundry for providing this font uh, for this demo. It's normally a commercial font. There are free fonts, though. There are free variable fonts. If you go to vfonts.com, you can see all of them, free and commercial. Um, the seventh thing I wanted to share with you uh, is called responsive flex with no media queries. So what does that mean? This is a very simple post component. Let's assume it's for like a blog, um, a forum post or something, a comment, whatever. And notice what happens when the, the viewport becomes smaller. It doesn't look very good. Now, we might, our, our first thought might be to add media queries. And this could work if we control the entire page. But it's not very scalable. Um, if we want to use the same component in multiple different contexts, the viewport doesn't, con doesn't define what's the width of the actual component which is why many people are asking for element queries, which we won't get anytime soon. There, there, it, there are many things to be resolved before we can get element queries, um, pri primarily that they are cyclical. So we can discuss this afterwards if you want, but it's highly unlikely that we'll get them anytime soon. Um, however, for this particular case, there are things we can do that sort of act like element queries, so we want to make this vertical when it's too small. 
So one thing we can do, at CSS looks like this right now, uh, just a simple flex box where the post has flex, flex of one. Uh, we can apply flex wrap, and then in small sizes it wraps, but it doesn't look very good because the heading doesn't stretch because it has no flex. We can apply flex of one and then it works, but then when we make it bigger, we now broke our layout. We don't want both of these columns to be equal size, so what can we do? We can change this to be a very large number, which works when you're small, because all it needs is some non-zero flexing, and it works when you're big as well. However, notice that it gets quite small before it wraps. Like it at this point, this is not a very readable forum post or comment or whatever. But all our existing CSS properties still work. We can say, we can specify a min width for the post and it still works. And basically that way we can control exactly when it changes. Like this is the smallest it can get. If we make it 20 ms, hmm. Yeah, because now it's, it's 20 ms even when it's vertical, so that's not that great. Let, apply a min width, but not like a tiny, tiny min, uh, not a huge min width, because it will be applied regardless. So the takeaways from the seventh one is, well, I was using flex, but ultimately I was setting flex grow behind the scenes and flex shrink and flex spaces were just their default values. And flex grow defines how the remaining space is distributed. Uh, zero means no expansion. In this case, we did want an expansion, so we had to set it to something bigger than, bigger than zero. And uh, this is based on the flex grow 999 hack uh, by Joran Van He. I'm, I hope he, I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, so the eighth, or the eighth secret is about grids. Grids are awesome. So here we have uh, 10 article elements with different classes. Um, each of them has a, a class of either cat or human, and uh, either male or female. And we can apply, we want them to be in two columns. So we can apply display grid and specify a grid template. Let's say 1FR for both of them. It doesn't really matter what the width is for this. And now we want to sort the cats to the first column and the humans to the second column. And notice what happened here. That is not what we expected. We just wanted two columns. This is not like a proper two column layout. The reason for that is that by default, grid Automatic grids are laid out horizontally, but we can change that with grid auto flow. We can say column, and then we change how this algorithm works, and it, 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 they're laid out by column. And we can change the sorting, we can swap the columns, it works just fine. We can change how they're sorted, like maybe make it male and female, still works. All we had to do was use grid auto flow, but grid auto flow is useful for a number of cases. Here we have 10 kittens. As you may have noticed, I also love cats. So, and we have a grid template of, let's say, four columns that are 200 pixels, and like this, vertically as well, but I don't like this repetition, so let's use a variable here. And here, okay. So notice that this looks kind of almost artsy, I would say, but not quite what we wanted, which was four, a four by four grid of cats. That's because, as Rachel mentioned this morning, when you have when your grid items, um, when your grid children are images or anything that has an intrinsic anything that has intrinsic dimensions, they are not stretched. 
they, so they just get their normal size. There are two ways to fix this. One would be to apply a width and height of 100%. How many of you are freaking out right now because these images are like stretched? Don't worry about this. I got you covered. And the other way to fix it is just explicitly align, um, align self stretch and justify self stretch. And we get the same result. Which one do you prefer? OK, let's keep it like that. So it's kind of a boring grid right now. So I want to make one of the kittens large. Let's say the third one. So we say grid column and span two, which means it spans two columns. It's this one, this cutie. And let's also make it span two rows because it's too cute for just one or two cells. OK, it still doesn't quite look nice. I, I, want to, I want to make another cut bigger as well. So let's say maybe the fifth one. And oh my god, what happened here? I got a hole in my grid. That's not nice. But I can still use grid autoflow to the rescue. So besides row and column, it also supports a keyword called dense. And dense just shifts grid items up to cover any holes that were created. And dense can also be combined with column. It just column and row changes how the algorithm works, and dense makes it dense. So isn't that a much nicer grid of kittens? So as you know, from Rachel's talk, CSS Grid has really good browser support today, and you don't need polyfills. Object Fit, in case you haven't seen it, is also, also has great browser support. Um, so the, eight, uh, the takeaways from this, Grid Autoflow defines the direction that auto automatic grids are laid out. The dense keywords, keyword can prevent holes by shifting items earlier. Um, and Object Fit Cover prevents image distortion, which I cannot think of a single case where you want to distort your images. Um, so the ninth one is about gradients, because I can't give a talk that doesn't mention gradients. Uh, so this is a plain linear gradient from white to black. I'm sure you've seen many of them. And we've all, we also have radial gradients. I'm sure you've seen many of them as well. Um, but a new type of gradient is conic gradient. It's called conic because it sort of looks like a cone with the right colors. Like if you look at a cone from above. This is something I proposed um, five years ago. And finally, it's making it into browsers. Um, it lets us do a lot of things, such as color pickers. But also, how, I mean, how often do we need to write color pickers? It can do way more useful things than that. So let's keep two color stops, and let's bring them close together. Let's bring this one close too. And actually, so notice that now that they're exactly at the same place, and it also works if this one is earlier too, so I usually just make them zero, and then they work with whatever number is coming before them. So what is this? This is a pie chart. And I can use CSS variables here for the value. And then I can change the value independently of the gradient. And you might be wondering, why is it cool why, to, to use a CSS variable for the value? Well, because then I can apply it in an inline style. Now I don't have to touch the CSS to change the pie chart, to change what the pie chart is displaying. Or I can display it with JavaScript. I can have like an attribute here and then some JavaScript that sets the variable. But notice that when I'm removing the value variable, I get nothing. So I, can, I should probably set a default, which is done like this. The var function accepts a, par a second parameter, which is a default. And I can also have multiple slices of the pie chart. Let's define a second one. And let's go here. 
and add another color. And now I can do this and move this up as well. Now I have two slices in my, in my pie chart and I can change this and it just updates. Both of these could be set in the inline style and I, I should probably set a variable um, default for this as well. And now I can basically control how many slices of this pie chart I have by just setting some CSS variables. And you can see how this works from multiple. I can have like 10 different segments, like 10 value, value two, value three, up to value nine or whatever. Um, and then I can have like up to 10 segments by just setting the right variables. I can even control which colors I'm seeing by just setting the right variables. And some of you might be wondering, okay, so if we, if we can do that, can we also animate it? Can we animate it is always a good question to add for anything CSS related. So let's try. What happens if we try to animate this, this uh, dash dash value property from zero to 100%? Let's set it to zero here. And I can try to do this and infinite. And what happened here? Isn't that kind of anticlimactic and disappointing? So the answer is by default, we cannot animate custom properties. And if you're working in production today, the answer is a flat out, we cannot animate custom properties. But it's going to get better. So we can run this JavaScript, CSS.register property, which lets you quite predictably register a property. And now if we go back, it's animating. Let's make it nice. Animating just fine. And I don't even need to, sp to specify the starting position because I've, I've, I've declared that this is a percentage. So obviously its initial value is zero. Unfortunately, well, conic gradients don't have great support. But they're coming in, in, they're already available in Chrome behind the flag and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be exposed in Chrome 69, finally. And CSS.register property also doesn't have great support. It's only available in Chrome and behind a flag. It's part of a new set of specifications called Houdini, which are created as a task force um, from the CSS working group and the, the technical architecture group at W3C. And it goes way beyond uh, CSS.register property. It's going to be a new set of JavaScript APIs that let us hook into things that only browsers could do earlier, like parse CSS so we can write polyfills. If, if you've ever tried to write a polyfill, a CSS polyfill, it's a huge pain. Um, we, we can parse CSS, we can uh, create new image types, we can do all sorts of things that previously were only accessible to browsers. Uh, it's, that's why it's called Houdini. Uh, it's sort of an inside joke because it's exposing browser magic to developers. Um, so, conic gradients are coming. Um, you've, you might have seen this before, a color stop at zero creates hard lines, this, uh, regardless of what the previous color stops are. Um, CSS variables increase flexibility, as we know, and uh, CSS.register property will allow us to animate custom properties. Can't wait. So the last thing I wanted to share with you today is called descendant grid items, which doesn't quite make sense uh, by itself, so I'll get right in it, uh, right to it. So here we have a login form with very simple HTML, just two labels, some text, and two inputs. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to, al to align these in a, in a two by two grid. So first step would be to say display grid. And then we define our grid templates, which is auto for the first column. We, we want username and password, that the column that has username and password to be as big as it needs to fit the contents and then one FR for the rest. And notice that we didn't quite get what we expected. That was not the grid we wanted to get. This is not a grid. This doesn't even look like a grid. 
I mean, it is one, but totally doesn't look like it. Why did that happen? Well, the browser did what we told it to do. It applied the grid layout to form, and it had two children, and we specified two columns. So the first column got the first label, the second column got the second label. That's how it works. And until recently, there would be no way to fix it. But now we can. So basically, what is it that we want here? If we could tell the browser what to do, we would probably tell it something like, you know what, actually, could you just ignore these label elements and just apply the, the grid to what's inside them? Well, we can actually say that with display contents. That's exactly what display contents does. It tells the browser to ignore this element for all intents and purposes, except selector matching. But when it comes to styling it, the browser completely ignores it. I mean, even if I try to apply like a border, it's not there. And yeah, let's apply some grid gap. Bigger. Yeah, that looks nicer. So there it is. That's the grid we wanted to do. Just with one line, we fixed the problem. Display contents is also useful uh, when you are laying out a website, for example, and you, want, you have a header element and you want, you want to apply the things inside the header to the grid. And you, so you can, uh, you can just apply display contents to the grid and then its children become grid items. Display contents has pretty decent browser support. Don't look at the amount of green and red when you see a, a table like that. It's misleading. Look at the percentages, and especially if you don't live, like, if, you, if, if you're developing websites for a specific market, you could also look at the percentages for that specific country, which kind of used also lets you do. So it looks like there's a fair bit of red here, but actually 70% uh, supports it. And you can always detect support with the at supports rule and apply these rules, ap apply specific rules only to browsers that support display contents. So the last takeaways, display contents allows us to make descendants of elements, flex or grid children of the parents. And text nodes are flex uh, or grid children too. Notice that we didn't have to wrap the words username and password with anything. So before I finish, uh, one last thing. This is a super quick feed feedback form, just basically which ones of these 10 things did you already know, um, which will help me improve future talks. And also, I have stickers. So if you want stickers, come find me. I'll be at the after party as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>